My grandfather designed a really neat fold-up ping pong table over 60 years ago, and I have really fond memories of playing on this table as a kid with my dad. I wanted to replicate this design, but I couldn't remember exactly how the folding mechanism worked. At this point, I scoured through a bunch of old home videos from the 80s to see if I could catch a glimpse of Grandpa's ping pong table that might help me determine just how he did it. Hi guys. After seeing it from several different angles and being overwhelmed by bombardment of 80s hair and some unflattering video of myself, yeah, that's me. I decided to take the next step and see if I could make a working model. I raided my son's Lego bin and I managed to create a pretty decent mock-up of how the ping pong table will fold up. At this point, I could model it up in Fusion 360. I simplified the design a bit and I made it all from 3 quarter inch material so that the entire thing could be built from several sheets of plywood. The design is pretty clever. Not only is it a regulation size ping pong table, but it can be folded up and wheeled out of the way when not in use. This will be perfect for my basement. When it's deployed, I can absolutely dominate my son when playing the game. And after I thoroughly crushed him and he leaves in a blind rage, I can fold it up and store it out of the way. Then when he wants to be obliterated at the game some more, it's easy to wheel it back into the room and open it up again. Alright, let's see if I can get this thing to work. The awesome folks over at Rockler said, hey, we like to play ping pong, we'll help. And I said, awesome, let's do this thing. Now, as you would have imagined, this project is pretty much made completely from plywood. This means that the first step is to convince your neighbor that they need to do some remodeling of their own. Then when they're not looking, discreetly liberate some of that lumber and head to your shop. To break down these large sheets in my tiny shop, I have to use my track saw. But once I have them cut down into more manageable sizes, I can then switch over and use the table saw. But before I do that, I want to put in a high tooth count blade that's meant for cutting plywood. This will give me nice crisp edges with my cuts. And once I had all that set, I could get busy cutting out all the pieces. And as I finished each group, I made sure to label it and check it off the list. Now, a lot like me, the sides to the table base have a weird shape to them. So I printed off a stencil from the design and I taped it together. I glued it to the piece of plywood with some craft adhesive and then I poked a couple holes at the drill points. Then at the bandsaw, I could remove the bulk of the material and then nibble away at the inside until I got it looking pretty good. The belt sander allowed me to refine the shape up to the line, and then I used a file and some hand sanding to get the shape just right. After drilling out the holes, I could replicate the piece by tracing it onto another piece of plywood and marking where the holes go. Then I rough cut the shape out on the bandsaw, stuck the pieces together with some CA glue and painter's tape, and used a flush trim bit in the router to make an exact copy. I broke them apart using my unparalleled strength and then took them over to the drill press to make the holes. Next, I need to make some spacers that go on the inside face of these pieces. So I used a hole saw and I cut a bunch of little circles and then glued them on using a drill bit to line them up just right. Now we're done with these pieces for a while. We'll get back to them later. Next, we're on to making the legs. Each of them have some rounded ends, so I use my compass to draw those on. Then I accentuate the center point so I can drill it out later, and I can nip off any extra length over at the miter saw. Then I can use my disc sander to take off the corners and to get that round shape on the end.
Lastly, I drill out the mounting holes on each side and then the inner legs are done. Now for the outer legs, those are thicker, so I need to laminate some pieces together. I use my glue spreader to quickly and evenly spread a layer of glue across all the faces. Then I sprinkled a pinch of salt over them because it makes them taste much better. And it just so happens that it also prevents the pieces from sliding out of position once clamping pressure is applied. The salt just ends up dissolving in the glue and it doesn't affect the adhesive properties at all. It actually works quite well. The outer legs are made up of six pieces total. Four legs and two stretchers that connect them. So I have a handful of laminations to do for them all. With everything glued up, I could leave it to dry overnight and check up on them the next morning and remove all the clamps. And just like with the inner legs, there's some curvy bits on these as well. So I draw them out with my compass, nip off the excess at the miter saw, and make them round over at the disc sander. Now each of these outer legs gets a dado cut in for the stretchers to fit into. And once I got that in each one, I could glue them up. Verify that they're square and clamp them to dry. And once they are dry, I could give them a good sanding and then the legs were done. Now I can move on to making the sides of the table. I start off by taping all the pieces together so I can look really strong while carrying it. I put a clean edge on one side, give it the old flipperoo, and then cut them to their final length. This is also nice because it ensures all four pieces will be exactly the same length after I cut them. These sides kind of have a weird shape to them though. I draw it out on one of the pieces and I use my track saw to cut most of it out. I'm careful to stop just short of where the edge veers off in another direction and then I come at it again from a different angle. Now just like before, I stop short of hitting my previous cut and then I can finish it off using a handsaw. Now that it's cut out, I can just plop it down on one of the other pieces, trace it out, break my pencil lead, crap. And say crap, transfer the drill holes, and rough cut the piece using my jigsaw. I'm careful to stay just on the outside of the line, and then I can clamp the two pieces together and use a flush trim bit and the router to make them identical. Now I can drill out the mounting holes and cut a few dados in each one for some support pieces that fit into a later step. So I plan to attach these pieces to the bottoms of the table surface with glue, but it'll be darn near impossible to clamp them. So with that in mind, I'll drill a bunch of pocket holes so that the screws can hold them down firmly while the glue dries. For the cross supports, I taped them all together and I nip off a bit of the ends because it looks cool? I don't know. I guess it's not really needed, but it does look better. I break out my clamp it squares and I tighten them onto the ends of the side pieces. Then using a flat piece of melamine, I can glue up the support structure and know that they're perfectly square and flat. I just beat them in a submission and then use a tape measure to verify that the distance between the sides is constant all the way down the piece. After this, I can move on to making the base. And this means a lot of pocket holes. And even more pocket holes. When gluing the pieces together, I was sure to use the clampet squares to not just hold things at a perfect 90 degrees, but also to prohibit things from moving when I'm driving in the pocket screws. They're really good for that. Once I got it together, I double checked that things are still square. Remember those weird looking pieces I made forever ago? Well, now I need to attach one to the bottom of the base. 
I spread some glue, line it up with the edge, pop on a square clamp, and then screw it down. With that in place, I can draw on a reference line, run a few beads of glue, and drop the center structure down into place. A few taparoos to get it lined up just right, and then I can drive in the screws. And to cover up those unsightly pocket holes, I just glued in some plugs. And once they dried in place, I could give it a quick sanding to make them flush. Now since 3 quarter inch plywood isn't actually 3 quarters of an inch, I ended up with like 1 16th of an inch of an overhang that needed to be removed. So I just flush trimmed it off and we're good to go. The next step calls for a bunch of 3 quarter inch square trim that will make up the center lines and the outer border of the entire surface of the table. And since I'm ultra fancy, I milled up some black walnut and I cut it down into a bunch of strips to use for this. I grabbed all my bandy clamps, ran a bead of glue down the edges of the panels, and then started clamping on the edging. These clamps make it super easy. After each panel dried, I could set it down on the bench and give it a good sanding to make the edging perfectly flush with the surface of the panel. And with the panels complete, I needed to join them together in pairs, but I don't have any clamps that can open up that big. So to solve that problem, I got out my Bessie extenders. These little things allow me to hook two of my big parallel clamps together. This lets me make four monster clamps that can open wider than my mouth can when I'm holding a bag of peanut M&Ms. I spread some glue down the center and then tighten things up, being sure to keep each side flush with one another. Once it had dried, I could use my track saw to give me a clean edge on both sides. Then with that trimmed and flush, I could pop on a couple more trim pieces to each one. And the ends that stuck out were lopped off with a flush trim saw. And then I could sand off any of the glue squeeze out to finish up both sides of the table surface. At this point, I could slap on some primer onto all the other pieces and then roll on a couple coats of flat black paint. When all of that dried, I could spread some glue on the tops of the support structures and glue them down onto the bottoms of each of the surface panels. Once I had it into position, I could throw on a few clamps where they'd reach and then drive in all the pocket screws into the holes that I previously drilled. Casters went on to the bottom And then the base was done, so I could drop it down onto the ground and roll it out of the shop. Now to account for variations in the floor, the bottoms of the outer legs get leveling feet installed. I found center of each one, drilled out a hole, twisted in the insert, and then screwed in the feet into each one. I broke all the sharp edges with a good sanding so that they're all a bit more friendly to the touch. I put my logo on the bottom of one of the sides, and then as a nod to my grandfather, and to show my appreciation of his original design, I incorporated a bit of him by driving in one of his old brass flathead screws. Now I could set up my makeshift spray booth and wheel each one of these surface sections back into it and give them one last good sanding before I start to spray finish on. And for that, I chose to use a clear matte water-based polyurethane since it'll offer all the protection I'll need and not have any distracting glare off of the surface. But I'm still gonna use that as an excuse if I lose at playing ping pong. Now I sprayed a total of four coats on the top and I sanded between each one to 220 to keep it perfectly smooth. Then once the final coat was done on both sides of the table surface, I could wheel them out and begin to put everything together. I started with a piano hinge that connects the two halves together. Then came bolting on the inner and outer legs onto each of the sides. 
and once that was done, I could drop the whole assembly onto the base and fasten it in. The crazy thing is, I hadn't even tested it up to this point, so I was dying to know if this thing would even work. I talked to my wife into giving me a hand with the first attempt. All right, I need help testing this thing. I have not tested it yet, so I am just hoping that it works. Okay, so probably right about here. And now as this comes down, you'll need to fold this up. So your side, and pull. It really is awesome. The super crisp seams between the trim and the plywood just turned out looking so nice. And using the trim to join the plywood, hide the edges, and act as the dividing lines just turned out great. And I don't know about you, but I actually really like the small imperfections in the surface that add character and figure. The table has a couple of these, and they just look so neat. But the coolest thing by far is just how the whole table folds up so easily. I just can't get enough of watching the folding mechanism work. It's so smooth and it's super handy to be able to store the table when it's not in use. So when we want to play, we just deploy the table, clamp on the net, grab our weapons, and we're ready to go. Well there you have it, the DIY Fisher's Fold Up Ping Pong Table. This thing is awesome and it was a lot of fun to build. If you'd like to build one yourself, I'll have detailed step-by-step -step plans available on my website over at fishersshoponline.com. Hey, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure to give it a like and a comment down below. And if you're new to the channel and you think I've earned it, consider subscribing. And if you'd like to support Fisher Shop, a really good way to do that is to become a member of the channel. There should be a join button on your player. You can get early access to my videos as well as badges and other perks too. So check it out. I'd be very grateful if you did. Thanks so much to Rockler for sponsoring the video too. I'll have links to all the Rockler products that I used in the build down in the video description. So if you saw something that looked interesting, you can find out more about it there. Well, it's about time I got back to playing with my boy. Take care, and I'll see you next time. Flip these bolts around. Oh gosh. Oh, you hit the camera again! <laughs> oh crap, skis. Crap. Oh, I missed! <laughs> That's perfect! <laughs> I totally missed. <laughs> oh my gosh.